Bible really is a remarkable book. It's the word of God. It tells us that and it gives us lots of evidence for the fact that it is the word of God. And we're not going to try and reprove that this afternoon. But one of the things the Bible does is it helps us to make sense of the world we see today. Although it was written a long time ago, it helps us to see why things happen and where they're leading. It gives us a framework in which we can understand the very confused news that we see in today's very confused world. And we're going to start by just thinking about what that framework is and then think a little bit more about the news itself. So the framework is this, that God has a master plan. The world is not spinning out of control. It is not uh, subject to whatever mankind decides to do with it. Ultimately, God has a master plan. And that master plan can be summarized very simply. In Psalm 72, we read, Blessed be his glorious name forever. Let the whole earth be filled with his glory. That's God's master plan to fill the world with his glory, his character, his presence. And I haven't just plucked that from one verse. We could look back in Numbers and read, As truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Or we could look in one of the prophets. The prophet Habakkuk and read, The earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And this is the consistent message of the Bible that God is going to fill the world with his glory, his character, if you like, and his power that men and women will see. Well, how will we do that? Well, he'll do that by establishing what's called in the Bible the kingdom of God, and he's going to establish it on the earth. And he's going to establish it by sending the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven, where he is today, to the earth to set up that kingdom. Now, if the idea of a kingdom of God on earth seems a little foreign to you, just think about the words of the Lord's Prayer, perhaps some of the best-known words of the Bible. In it, we're taught to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So we can see it really is a fundamental part of the Bible message. And then there's a lot of the Bible that is given over to talking to us about what this kingdom will be like. We're not going to look at this now, but we could look at one of the other prophets, Daniel, and read that in the days of these kings, and for reasons I'll explain, I believe that's the days we live in, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. The kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So that is God's plan. That's where world history is heading. That's where it's all going to end up. And of course, you can see that gives us something of a framework through which to look at the news and the events of today's world. But let's paint the picture in a little bit more detail because we've perhaps got the broad framework there, but let's think about what this kingdom will be like because the gospel means good news and this kingdom really is good news for those who are welcomed into it. I'd like to take a few verses from Psalm 72 because this psalm gives us some descriptions of what this kingdom will be like on the earth ruled over by the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm just going to pick a few verses. I would heartily recommend spending the time to read the whole chapter. Psalm 72 and verse 5. Here we read, They shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations so this is a kingdom that lasts forever and that is the same as we have on the screen there don't we that this kingdom will last forever it will last for a very long time and then we start to read about the conditions have a look at verse 7 of psalm 72 in his days shall the righteous flourish and abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth So in those days, people who are described as righteous, they're people who are right with God, will flourish. And it will be a time of peace. Continuing in verse 8. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him, and his enemies shall lick the dust. So this is a kingdom that will be worldwide, and where no opposition will be allowed. 
God's rules will be applied, God's laws. Verse 11, we have this reinforced for us. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. More good news in verse 12. He shall deliver the needy when he crieth, the poor also, and him that hath no helper. He shall spare the poor and needy, and shall save the souls of the needy. He shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. So this kingdom will be a place of justice for everybody, where the weak and the underprivileged are cared for and supported, where there is no oppression, where violence is done away with, where human life is, 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 is looked after as the God-given gift that it is. So it really is good news, this kingdom on the earth. Come down to verse 16 with me. There shall be a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. Now you might say, well, what, what's the big deal about that? I could put a handful of corn in my pocket and take it and put it on the top of a mountain today. Well, in Bible language, it doesn't just mean a handful. It means hands full. It means a huge amount. It's a Bible idiom that means a great abundance of corn. And where does corn not grow today? Well, on the tops of the mountains, of course. It's telling us about a time when there will be a superabundance of food and the base materials we need for life. Carrying on in verse 16, the fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon, and they of the city shall flourish like the grass of the earth. His name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. So the Bible's telling us about an absolutely wonderful time that's going to come on this earth when the Lord Jesus Christ will rule, God's laws will be applied and people will live in peace and in harmony with enough food, water and everything else we need for life for everybody. And then down in verse 19 we have the verse that we started with. Blessed be his glorious name forever, let the whole earth be filled with his glory. So there we have this framework that I'm talking about we have God's master plan which is to establish this kingdom and thereby to show his character to show his glory throughout the whole world right then let's have a look at the news because we have to say when we look at the news it's a pretty long distance from what we've just been reading about and we can see why it would need the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the establishment of a completely new world order we're going to look at three things to do with the Bible in the news. World leaders, global, un uh, global unrest and society's problems. And we'll start with world leaders. This is very current at the moment. Ever since the US election, which it's hard to imagine was only a month ago, uh, we don't go an hour without the news showing us the latest antics of President Trump and his, uh, and his uh, administration. In fact, even yesterday, the president had to go and do a rally in Florida to try and tell the nation that everything was going swimmingly, they didn't need to worry and everything was under control. Um, I think most of the world would disagree and there's an awful lot of controversy about the things the new president does, about the things he says, about the influences he has. Um, not least the, the chap top right, President Putin. The big discussion is whether the president of Russia has any level of control over the president of the United States and of course that would have some severe implications for for world stability. So at the moment, there's an awful lot of focus on world leaders. And, and there are those who think these world leaders are great, they're doing fabulous things, and then there's others who are perhaps a little less sure, actually are far surer that they're doing terrible things. My job's not to comment, more to point out that they are in our news, aren't they? And then we get to some of the other people who are in the news at the moment. Um, bottom left, we have Kim Jong-un, uh, the latest uh, leader of North Korea, which is something of an enigma to the rest of the world. What on earth are they doing? Firing missiles in the direction of Japan, which doesn't seem to be the best way to guarantee world stability. Uh, and again, if you listen to today's news, you'll hear an investigation going on in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, because Kim Jong-un's half-brother was assassinated in their airport. And they're now trying to work out exactly who did it and on whose orders and why. So another leader who is somewhat inscrutable and who is occupying the world headlines. And then we think of our European leaders. Um, and we, we've got Pre um, Prime Minister um, Theresa May and we've got Angela Merkel from Germany. 
uh, amongst all the others, trying to make sense both of the British exit, the Brexit from the European Union and what will happen and when, and also the challenges that they're facing for, for example, far-right groups in France and then they're rising elsewhere um, in Italy, for example, and some of the sub-nationalist uh, pro protests that are going on in places like Catalonia and the Basque region and other parts of Europe, so there's a great deal of unrest. And the focus there is, again, uh, upon the leaders. So how do we make sense of this? Clearly, we don't know exactly what's going to happen in the US, in Russia, in, in Asia Pacific, or, or North Korea in particular, or in Europe. How do we make sense of this? How do we judge leaders? Well, come with me, please, to the prophet Daniel in chapter 4. Because, as you may have noticed, the commentators in the news and the, the rest of the media... They struggle to make sense of this, and you can understand why things change so quickly, people's motives are not clear, nobody knows how all these things will play together. What the Bible gives us is great confidence so that we can look at our leaders in a light that shouldn't shake our confidence. What the Bible tells us is not to worry, and it tells us not to worry because the leaders who are in place have been put there by God. It doesn't say they're good. I'm not here to tell you that Donald Trump or any other characters on our slide are good. That's not the point. They've been put there because God is working out his purpose and he uses sometimes good people, sometimes bad people, to work out the things he wants to do. Remember, his plan is to bring about the kingdom of God. Well, in Daniel chapter 4, we're with the man Daniel and we're with the king Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, a very proud man who ran the world empire of the day and believed he was almost divine, if you like. And he had a lesson to learn. Um, again, it's worth reading the whole chapter to get the, the full story, but we're just going to dive in and look at the lesson. Verse 17. This is the message he receives. It says, Daniel 4, verse 17. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, the Most High, another name for God, he rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. So we're being told that actually God's in control, he sets up the leaders, and sometimes they will be the basest of men. And there's two ways of reading that. It could mean the most humble of men, which Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar certainly wasn't, and most of our world leaders certainly aren't. It could also mean the most immoral of people. And again, that's the sort of thing that leaders do often get called into question for. So just because someone's in power doesn't mean they're good, but it does mean that God has put them there for his own purpose. He's going to use them one way or another. And actually, we have this message repeated for us. Come down to verse 25, please. Um, and we're going in towards the end of the verse 25, where we read... Till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it, giveth it to whomsoever he will. So it's hammering the point home. And at the end of the experience of this chapter, Nebuchadnezzar makes this statement. Verse 34. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honoured him that liveth for ever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth none can stay his hand or say to him what doest thou in other words Nebuchadnezzar this proud powerful king after the experience of this chapter learned God is in charge God controls the affairs of high politics of normal people like you and me and ultimately he's bringing about his purpose say so it doesn't mean the people in charge are good it doesn't necessarily mean they're bad but it means it's in God's plan and we have the opportunity to watch it I'd like to give you an example of this um, will you come with me to Isaiah and chapter 44 please Isaiah is a couple of hundred years earlier than the time of Daniel. But, but here we, we meet a character called Cyrus. 
Now, Isaiah is prophesying several hundred years before the time of Cyrus. Cyrus would actually come after Nebuchadnezzar that we've been reading about. Another one of the amazing ways in which the Bible proves it's the word of God, because that's the only way prophecy could be given. But it's talking about Cyrus. He was the king of the Medo-Persian Empire. The emperor, I suppose. Um, And he had certain things that God was going to use him to do. And this is a good example of God ruling in the kingdoms of men. We go into the very last verse of chapter 44 of Isaiah. Speaking of God, it says that Seth of Cyrus, so he's naming him hundreds of years before he'd be born, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. Now when Cyrus was king, Jerusalem and the temple lay in ruins. But it was Cyrus who told the people of Israel, who were exiled at the time, to return to Jerusalem. And here we've been told hundreds of years in in advance that God put him there. God put him in place so that he could send the people back. It doesn't say here that he's particularly good. It doesn't say he was particularly bad. But it does say that God was using him. And if we continue into chapter 45 and read verse 1... Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden. So God makes it very clear that he's the one who's put put him in place. And verse 4, he reminds us of why. For Jacob, or Israel, my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. So here we've been reminded, Cyrus wasn't a godly man. He was just the king. But God used him to effect his purpose. And that's what God does with world leaders today. So whilst we don't always know what the steps will be between today and the establishment of the kingdom of God, we can have confidence that those leaders, however crazy they may seem at times, are being used by God to bring about his purpose. Well, let's move on. Society's problems. Society has a lot of problems. We, we're looking much closer to home now. We're not looking at the White House and the Kremlin and, uh, and Pyongyang. We're looking at the men and women who live around us. And we see amongst those people some terrible difficulties. And, and the, the graphic on the slide just illustrates a few of those. that p- Things people are worried about, things people are concerned about. We only have to think about things like crime, drugs of different sorts, the effect that has on families and family breakdown, the effect on law and order crime and violence in particularly in the cities but elsewhere as well people being very selfish people looking out for themselves and losing a sense of community and wanting to care for their fellow men and women um, need I go on there are lots of things that we see in today's world which are causing a, a level of disintegration in the social strata and it, it's, it's very depressing to look at well come with me to 2 Timothy we're in the New Testament now the second letter to Timothy chapter 3 because the Bible preempts this there have always been problems with society men and women struggle to do the right things by each other and they always struggle to do the things God wants them to do and so society's always had challenges but I would argue that The challenges of today's society are tougher and more fundamental than perhaps men and women have ever experienced. And and, and it is a constant concern. And successive governments have tried to instill... You remember they talked about the big society and they talk about community values. And if you were to go back 20 or 30 years, it was all about back to basics. These were all similar programmes trying to bring back basic standards and decency between people and so to rebuild... uh, the, the, the fabric of society and they've struggled for the reasons we've said but look at this 2 Timothy chapter 3 this know also verse 1 sorry verse 1 of 2 Timothy 3 this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come men shall be lovers of their own selves covetous boasters proud blasphemers Disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, which means without self-control, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, 
heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And I have to say, that's a really unpleasant few verses to read, isn't it? Because those are really unpleasant characteristics. And they're not the sort of characteristics we'd want anybody to say of us, I'm sure, or that we'd want to project onto people we know. But those are the characteristics that give rise to the problems of today's society. That selfishness, that lack of trust, that lack of natural affection, that lack of care for one another, that lack of basic principle, which affects so many people to different extents in different ways. And we see here how the New Testament is, is showing us that's exactly what the world will be like when Jesus is going to come back. That, that's how bad it will get. And I don't want to depress you any further, but we could easily go into our newspapers any day, couldn't we, and see examples. We sometimes call it man's inhumanity to man. That tends to be perhaps at a, 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 a more violent level. But, but these things, that these petty and major crimes, this lack of care for one another and the fabric of society starting to come unraveled as things like the family unit no longer become the norm. Isn't it good news that the Bible was able to actually predict this? And so again, we can look at the things we see in the news, and yes, they make us sad. Don't get me wrong, there's some terrible things happening. But we can look at it and say, actually, it's a signpost. It's a signpost that Jesus is going to come back, and that God is going to establish his kingdom on the earth. So, moving our view, perhaps again to more of a global scale, let, let's think about global unrest. Clearly, this is linked both to society's problems and to world leaders, isn't it? It's, 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 th these things are all totally interlinked. But global unrest is, is, is a huge problem today, isn't it? Now, I've chosen pictures that are really taken from the Middle East. You've got a picture of a street scene in, in Syria, in Aleppo in particular, top left, You've got the ISIS flag being flown in the middle. Um, there's the weaponry that's being used both by the local nations but also people like Russia who are involved in Syria in particular. Um, and then the human cost, those refugees who we're seeing across the Middle East and trying to get into Europe in absolutely desperate straits. And we see the suffering of men, women and children on a huge scale caused by the global unrest. Now, I've just picked one little area of the globe, which in many ways is the epicentre of things we see, but we know we could look at places in Africa, places in South America, places in Asia, to see equally that there is unrest, there is violence, there is war. Um, and, and we don't know what to do about it. Mankind holds summit after summit trying to find peaceful solutions. And let me say, I think these generally are well-meaning individuals who are trying to find a solution and yet have not been able to. And, th and this, this has been the, s the principle for 100 years now. After the First World War, in 1919, when the Treaty of Versailles was closed, they set up the League of Nations to try and bring nations together and talk about problems. And, and, and that failed to present, prevent the Second World War. And after the Second World War, they established the United Nations, which, we, of course, we know about today. Again, well-meaning people trying to solve the world's problems and yet unable because... That's the way mankind is. Will you come with me, please, to words of Jesus in Luke chapter 21? Because, again, the Bible foretold that this would happen. Say, so we're with the words of Jesus here, the greatest prophet. He could foretell what was going to happen. And, again, just as with the other examples, he gives us a lens, if you like, through which we can look at the news and see it in a more positive light. Because I have to say, personally, if I was looking at just the, the sort of relatively high-level examples we've looked at so far, I would look at the world and say it's in chaos and I don't know where it's going to end up without this, this lens to look at it or this framework through which to look at it of the, king, of the power of God. Well, Jesus is talking in Luke 21 and he talks about some of the things that would happen between his own day and the days when he would return. And, and let's just look at some of the things he talks about. Verse 9. When you shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified. For these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Then said he unto them, nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. 
and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places and famines and pestilences and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. It says there will be some terrible things happening in the earth. And it's particularly interesting the, the expression he uses about nation rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom because they are, if you think about it, it, it sounds like he's saying the same thing twice, doesn't it? But it, he isn't. You see, kingdom, the word he uses, means a kingdom, a nation state as we might see it today. The word he uses for nation implies more to a race, as in a nationality. And in today's world, referred earlier to people like the Catalans and the Basques, um, to the, the French-speaking Canadians, and other parts, particularly in Asia, where there are uh, races of people who have their own language but are part of another state. And, and, and often the violence and the unrest comes from friction between those, those races. So actually Jesus was astoundingly accurate in what he was talking about, because it's not just nation state against nation state, it's also race against race. So Jesus foretold that this would happen. Well, let's try and find some good news, shall we? Come, come with me to verse 26. Sorry, verse 25. Because he talks more about things that would happen, particularly some things that would happen um, shortly after the time he was speaking. But then he moves forward in time uh, to, to the world we see today. He says in verse 25. There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Well, that's what we've been talking about, isn't it? The, the distress of nations with perplexity means they don't know what to do. don't know what to do about it. That's exactly what we see. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And again, as I say, if you were to look at the news without any support from the Bible it, it, it looks terrifying and you could see why people's hearts might fail them for fear but verse 27 then shall they see the son of man and that's a term Jesus uses of himself coming in a cloud with power and great glory he says these are signposts just as society's problems are signposts so wars and violence and unrest are a signpost that I'm coming back says Jesus and we know what he's going to come back to do. He's going to come back to establish the kingdom of God. And so, verse 28, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. He said, that's when you should be positive. Verse 31, he hammers it home for us. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. So when we look at the news, when we think of the crazy things our world leaders do, and when we're not sure quite what they're going to do and what they'll do next and why they're doing it, when we see the problems closer to home of society, when we look at global unrest and terrorism and security fears that, that all come together and, and, and cause us great fear and upset, the Bible gives us confidence. Because the Bible tells us that God has this master plan. That all of these things are signposts that he's going to send the Lord Jesus Christ back soon. And that he is going to establish the kingdom of God and fill the world with the glory of God. And that's the good news. That's the good news. So when we see the bad news on our TV, let's open the Bible. And let's read the good news and respond. Because God wants you and me to be in that kingdom. And it's going to come very soon. Thank you.